Today, uh, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce the F.A. Hayek Memorial Lecturer. Uh, William Butos received his B.A. in economics from Brooklyn College. He holds an M.A. in economics from uh, City University of New York and a Ph.D. in economics from Penn State, where he worked under Will E. Mason, uh, an, uh, an unduly neglected monetary theorist. Uh, Bill is currently professor of economics at Trinity College, where he has taught since 1981 and holds the George M. Ferris Chair of Corporation Finance. He has served as president of the Society for the Development of Austrian Economics and is currently on the board of editors of the Journal of Private Enterprise. Since 1993, he has been a visiting scholar and my colleague at, at NYU's Austrian Economics Program. He edited Will Mason's magnum opus on neoclassical versus classical monetary theories and has recently published The Social Science of Hayek's The Sensory Order. He's published widely in monetary economics, the history of economic thought, and the economics of science, and is currently working on the political economy of government and science with co-author Thomas McQuaid. Bill is the leading authority on monetary and social thought of, Hay of Hayek, and as my good friend, has guided me to much greater appreciation for the uh, breadth and profundity of Hayek's contributions to monetary and business cycle theory. Bill will be addressing us today on Hayekian social orders and institutions. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, especially special thanks to Joe uh, for the kind remarks and also for inviting me here. Uh, it's been sev several years, a long hiatus since I was here last, and many things have changed. And it's uh, just wonderful to see the uh, Mises Institute uh, having arrived to this state. And it's, uh, I just congratulate Lou Rockwell, Joe, and all the others who have made this possible. Uh, I'm, I, for 30 plus years, I've been teaching courses, and uh, almost all of my courses are an hour and 15 minutes in length. And uh, so I'm kind of pre-programmed, uh, I guess, to speak about for about an hour and 15 minutes. However, uh, Joe has made it very clear that uh, uh, once my time is up, I will be literally hauled off the stage. So uh, to, 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 to ensure at least the higher high probability that I'll be able to uh, address some questions from the audience, I, I'll probably stick, stick to my text. And, uh, and, and I think uh, if, if things work out well, there should be uh, several minutes uh, left over at the end for your questions or comments. Uh, so let me just start. And again, uh, it's, it's so great to be here. I'm thrilled. And uh, I, I, I'm going to talk today about uh, some of the, the – what in retrospect – has uh, been questions that sort of uh, com you know speak to what I've done in my research efforts. Uh, so uh, these questions, which uh, maybe haven't interested everyone, uh, nonetheless have interested me, and I hope I can uh, uh, extend uh, an invitation for you to think about these things and perhaps embark upon uh, uh, your own efforts in this direction. Uh, now. One thing we know, I'm going to start reading now, so I hope you don't take that uh, the wrong way, but it's, I think for time's sake I better do that. Uh, we, we know from Hayek that a vital characteristic of markets is that they transmit local knowledge in a form that is widely available to market participants, they, that they solve the problem of the division of knowledge. But the basic idea that I wish to promote is that this knowledge-enhancing characteristic is to be found in certain other social arrangements as well, and that a fruitful way of looking at social orders in general is to focus on an understanding of their ability to, uh, to uh, not only uh, in terms of their knowledge-using characteristics, but also in terms of their adaptive capacities. And so what I'm going to do is sketch out some ideas that I've been working on uh, that emphasizes the, the, the way in which social orders actually generate knowledge and how they can be usefully applied to two distinct realms of inquiry, the scientific order and also the monetary order. Okay? So as Hayek pointed out in Economics of Knowledge, once we move from the analysis of a single person to the interactions of many persons, we really do enter into an entirely different realm of investigation. The aim of my remarks this morning is to take seriously Hayek's claim. More specifically, 
I hope to explore the idea that social orders differ with respect to their knowledge, using, and adaptive capacities, and that such differences indeed are very significant. What I propose to do here is to show how and why these kinds of knowledge problems, if you wish to call them that, matter in two fields of inquiry. First, from the general field of the economics of science, I will examine the scientific order and the effect specifically of government funding and regulation on the production of scientific knowledge. Second, I will consider whether we can assume an, a, uh, that certain economic propositions apply with equal cogency to laissez-faire and central banking monetary systems. So there's a two-pronged uh, approach that I'm going to pursue here today, one in the scientific realm of, e of the economics of science, and another that I'll try to address in terms of the different monetary orders. In both cases, the object is to understand how the scientific and mon monetary orders function under different institutional frameworks in terms of their knowledge using and adaptive capacities. Now, social orders come in various guises and forms. I shall refer to them quite simply uh, as structures uh, comprised of individuals interacting according to specific routines, rules, routines, and uh, whatever institutions that may apply to them as well. Now, for example, we can envision a particular uh, social order like the Cadillacy, uh, the market order, uh, as referring to in the abstract to an open-ended system of voluntary exchange of property rights in which actors pursue ends under scarcity and whose behaviors are constrained by rules and conventions governing those exchanges. The aim of each agent, of course, is to engage in action to relieve, as Mises put it, felt uneasiness, and in so doing, within the framework of property rights, the ongoing interactions of agents produce as a byproduct of that process an order of having various attributes and outcomes. Now, I want to highlight just two general propositions that any order uh, can, will satisfy ordinarily, uh, and uh, my specific context for the moment will be the catalaxy. Now, first, as a byproduct and unintended consequence of individuals' actions, monetary market prices are an emergent characteristic of the exchange process and could only have arisen by that process and in no other way. The system of exchange under the conditions specified, the institutional arrangements that govern the operation of the order itself, transform the actions of individuals into system-level outputs, market prices, that could not have been generated or known in the absence of the actual process from which they emerge. Such system-level outputs are not aggregated from the attributes of the system's individuals, because during the process of interaction, those attributes undergo change and adjustment. The system's outputs represent a transformative process. We can say that prices are a kind of knowledge generated by the system itself. Now, this suggests that institutional arrangements matter for the market process and that the specific outputs the system generates will be institutionally dependent. For example, the rental market for apartments will generate outputs in the form of prices, quantities, and other characteristics of the goods that are exchanged. Okay? But uh, arguably, those outputs and those outcomes are going to be different under laissez-faire than they will be under an interventionist sort of system. Okay? And while the system in both cases is doing the best it can, presumably, we also know that the system's capacity to produce prices and other outputs to best meet the wishes of the consumers is different under each regime. Okay? Now, a second feature of the market process is that the market should be understood as open-ended feedback systems. The emergent constellation of monetary prices constitute relevant knowledge inputs for agents to revise their plans and actions for engaging in subsequent exchanges. More than that, the changing pattern of market prices itself induces a self-generating discovery process of entrepreneurial activity, and also the discovery of new preferences by consumers as well. How well the system is able to satisfy the wishes of the consumer will depend on the feedback properties of the system, and those properties cannot be divorced from the framework of institutions the system is governed by. For example, 
Returning to the rent control case mentioned above, the market under rent control is affected by the absence of price feedback signals that correspond to underlying supply and demand conditions. The familiar makeshifts and workarounds we see in regulated markets, for example, such as the deterioration in the case of rent control of the quality of housing, uh, the disappearance of high-end housing or apartments, uh, and are all reflections of the regulation that is imposed. The system has adapted okay, to the prevailing institutional situation, but its adapt <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> but its adaptive responses are not the same as those the that to the prevailing institutional environment that would have been generated by laissez-faire. Feedback systems, like the market, both under laissez-faire and intervention, are adaptive systems, and their adaptive qualities may be efficacious or not, depending upon the institutional arrangements. Summarizing, my point is that social orders differ with respect to their knowledge using and adaptive capacities. This perspective provides a way one of many ways, but certainly a way, to analyze how alternative institutional arrangements are likely to affect the way social orders function. Okay. Now, I'd, <clears throat> I'd like, let me just move on uh, to the scientific order. Okay, And again, I'm, I'm, I'm not playing a fair game here in some sense, because what I'm concentrating on is a particular kind of so- framework in which I'm going to frame my discussion that is governed more largely by government intervention. Uh, that is uh, a, a result of many factors. Perhaps we can talk about those later. But that's the context in which I wish to pursue my remarks to demonstrate how the these third-party interventions, in this case this, into the scientific order, really do affect the scientific order itself. Okay. Now, since the time of at least Michael Polanyi, work in this area, we have reason to see science as a particular kind of emergent social order, albeit not a strictly catalactic one, okay? especially regarding so-called basic research. And you can talk about other kinds of research activities regarding development and so forth, which are more closely aligned to a, a market uh, context, but basic research is generally not. Okay, and that's what I want to kind of talk about here. In general, science has its own institutions by which individual scientists undertake and communicate their knowledge findings to others, largely via publication, lectures, conferences, initiating an essentially adaptive process of interaction among scientists as they debate and marshal evidence to critique and extend the work of others. What emerges as warranted scientific truth Okay. Now, this is again. I'm talking about science in the case of like physics or chemistry, uh, which is, have strong empirical content to them. Uh, but what emerges is warranted scientific truth in the sense of codifiable and articulated propositions about the real world. Reflect a process of interaction within the scientific community, having the capacity to transform the work of an individual scientist into something considerably different and more possibly momentous. We do not know ex ante what scientific insights, for example, will be generated by by this process for the simple reason scientific knowledge emerges precisely because as something new. That's what we usually mean by scientific knowledge. Something, we learned something we didn't know before. Okay. It's similar in this respect to a market process in that in the market process, on the other hand, it's prices that emerge principally as a byproduct of these interactions. But in science, we have a, a different kind of knowledge that's generated, scientific knowledge. Okay? Perhaps more importantly for the purpose at hand, however, it is, I want to emphasize that it's the institutional arrangements of any particular order that are likely to prove decisive in affecting the kind of knowledge science actually generates. Okay, now standard neoclassical economics of science, which has its roots in the work of Nelson Arrow and many others, okay, specifically insulates science from any kind of institutional context. In doing so, the main thrust of neoclassical work assumes widespread market failure, in quotes, and science on the grounds that scientific knowledge is non-appropriable and hence creates a public goods problem requiring, as the story goes, government subsidies to achieve so-called optimal output of knowledge. Okay. Someone should tell, I don't know what that means anymore, uh, but that's what they claim. Uh, Nelson claimed that back in 1955. 
So, uh, now, th this is not to say that, uh, that people have questioned this. And indeed, there's a, a large emerging body of work uh, by some very good people, Terence Keeley, uh, James Bennett up at GMU, and others who have questioned this whole framework within which neoclassical economics has constructed this view of what's, what science is and the necessity for government intervention. Uh, I might add that Thomas McQuaid and I, who Joe uh, thankfully mentioned uh, as, a, as my frequent co-author, uh, and I have examined science in, in some detail from the point of view of a particular kind of Hayekian social order. And in, in particular, our concerns have focused on how government funding affects that order. And that's what I want to turn to now. How is it? What ways can we unpack the effect of government funding on the actual scientific uh, order itself? Now, uh, I'm going to put a I already covered that. My, my remarks are going to cover those three things there. The, the, the three big Ds, as I like to think of it. Uh, directional effects, destabilizing effects, and distorting effects. Okay? Uh, now, the driving force uh, for government funding of science has historically centered on military and defense considerations. And only since the 1950s, really, on, this, on the presumed market failure in basic research. Uh, still more recently, uh, to see how these things morph into something uh, very different, in fact, that argument has been applied to commercial R&D as well, especially in Europe, and increasingly so in America. Okay? Well, I'll be, why I believe these justifications are absolutely questionable and ought to be questioned, the discussion must be, that discussion must be set aside for the time being. Okay. A lot of work has been done in this. I want to concentrate on something a little bit different. Instead, I want to briefly consider the ways government funding uh, of science as such affects science in terms of its functioning as an adaptive social order. Okay. Now, it's not necessary to presume, I might add, that scientists are uh, angels on earth and have the highest and best of motives. Uh, scientists are all kinds of people. They have different kinds of uh, in intent. Uh, some of them approach their work vocationally uh, as something they would do in any case if, as long as they have the resources. Uh, but other people are known to, to cut corners and so forth and so on. Okay. So science is not this pure kind of uh, enterprise necessarily. It's composed of real people. Okay. But, the, but the problem here, of course, is that these real people have to have a source of income, and the source of income is necessary for them not only to you know, generate their own standards of living that, uh, and the custom that their wives are, would like to be accustomed to, but also uh, they need resources for research. And so where is that going to come from? Well, uh, during, for example, the 19th century, there was no government funding of research to speak of. Uh, there's one important exception, maybe. Uh, John Adams uh, saw to it that the Naval Observatory in Washington, D.C. Uh, came under, the, uh, under government funding after a long, long debate. Uh, but he got that. But other than those sorts of things, maybe the Lewis and Clark, uh, very little funding of government, uh, by government of science. Okay? Uh, indeed, uh, during the 19th century in America, uh, as James Bennett points out, uh, the, the United States be became a leader uh, in astronomical research and the, the building of uh, observatories, all with private money. Okay? Uh, there you go. Uh, my argument, of course, for another day would be let's, let's use that kind of model for science today. But that's, again, another story. Okay? So let me just highlight, if I might, uh, some, some, uh, some of these effects that I... I've, uh, Th Thomas McQuaid and I have kind of thought about and organized in this fashion. It's kind of a taxonomy, if you will, of the effects of government funding on science. Okay. Now, uh, these directional effects, whether they're funded by government or private philanthropists or what have you, are always going to be designed to, not always, but generally will be designed to satisfy the interests of the donors. And that's only natural. 
Uh, the, 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 the donors have a vested interest in seeing to it that certain kinds of questions are asked. Hopefully they also have some kind of agenda hoping that certain results will be obtained from that funding. And that's all fine and dandy. In the world of philanthropy, there's enough separate units of philanthropists such that you get a wide and, and interesting diversity of scientists doing their own thing that generates a very vibrant kind of scientific order. Okay? But when we turn to government, what we're talking about here is a big player. We're talking about a, a, an, inst a, an institution, the government, which not only, not only uh, has the capacity to tax people and use those tax funds to support funding, which is bad enough, of course, but to, to, but to add injury to insult, the government also obviously has its own set of agenda items, its own ideology, and it, its own kinds of constraints as governed by the political process and cowtailing to it. Okay, so what we observe in these the government funding, and this has been documented by uh, all kinds of researchers, uh, Savage and others have written extensively on this. It's well worth your looking into uh, that uh, that the government not only is, is not this you know, uh, isolated, disinterested uh, funder of science, but rather, but rather tries to mold the direction of science to suit its aims. Okay? And we see this all the time. For example, uh, under George W. Bush, George Bush II, uh, he allocated for NASA all kinds of funding that was designed to ensure uh, space exploration, uh, you know, sending probes out to Mars and all of that, okay? Uh, Obama comes into office and he immediately kills that NASA program and all the money that went with it and redirects those funds to NASA with the, with the specific uh, charge of sending satellites up so they can study Earth climatology. Okay, so there was, all the, all the, all governments do this. They, they have their own agendas and they all funnel money in the way that they think is best. Okay, uh, I could go on and on about this stuff. I mean, you can just imagine the the, the kinds of uh, sausage machine that we're talking about here with uh, government funding. Uh, but I think you get the point that that, that government has a, a real interest and executes and implements its interests to achieve certain effects directionally on the course of science. Now, this does not mean that the science that's being performed is necessarily second rate. You know, if you're going to fund, uh, uh, say, breast cancer research uh, at uh, Sloan Kettering Hospital in New York, the presumption would be that those scientists are fully competent to generate sensible science. Okay? It's not that the science gets corrupted per se. Okay? It's what the, what the funding is used for that is the issue here. Okay? So I don't want to be clear about that. Uh, let me move on to destabilizing effects. And uh, uh, here, too, uh, go government funding uh, is, is uh, subject, of course, to the, the, the fleeting movements of political uh, ideology and the process, the political process itself. So you have uh, one, as I explained with George W. Bush versus Obama's uh, space exploration initiatives, the the one president comes in, one set of uh, policymakers come in, and they have a particular thing they want to do. The next bunch come in, and they want to reverse that, do, do something different. Okay. The problem here is that in many cases, the funding amounts are so large okay, uh, that we're talking about massive, in effect, massive real reallocations of resources from one kind of use to another. That is to say, the, the, the scientific community Okay, is uh, responding in part to the ideology and the agenda items that the administration and its uh, it, its its acolytes are putting forth. Okay, and they will do that science. Scientists need the money; they're they're happy to do that. The next bunch comes in, and by gosh, the the funding priorities change, and those scientists have to switch or move, but in the process, okay, a lot of graduate students have been educated according to the prior uh, set of agenda items. 
You know, they're, they're not trained to do something maybe new right away. There's capital investment and so forth. So we, what we have here is this kind of, uh, and, it, and it's demonstrable. Uh, it, you can actually track this stuff. Uh, you, you, you can see the, 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 the tides of, of change uh, uh, wafting through the scientific community as the funding priorities change. Okay? Now, these are destabilizing. The, the, it's, 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 it's analogous, not the same thing, obviously, but it's similar to the, 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 the effects that we talk about in Austrian business cycle theory. Okay? It's, 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 a different, it's a different kind of reallocation. It concerns different kinds of questions, but it's essentially the same process. And there's examples up the kazoo that, uh, that demonstrate that these things can be very significant. Back in the 80s, Japan, for example, was trying to generate what was called then fifth-generation computers, these supercomputers. Japan invested hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars into the, into the research uh, for, for this. And, of course, uh, the U.K., Germany, France, America, and other countries said, hey, we can't let the Japanese get ahead of us on this particular thing. So they followed suit. Okay? And after billions and billions of dollars... Uh, around the world spent on these, these, this research, what came of it? Nothing. Very little. Nothing, nothing momentous. Okay? So that was, de- that's, that's what I mean by destabilizing. Okay? And it can be, it can be severe, it can be minor, but it's something that we have to keep track of because it does affect how well the scientific order is going to function. Okay? Now, uh, <laughs> distorting effects. Uh, this is a little bit more slippery. Okay? Um, this kind this is a third effect, uh, but a potentially much more serious and injurious effect that uh, can uh, affect the scientific order. Okay. This occurs, I think how I define it anyway, uh, if the evolved institutions of science that confer legitimacy on the work of scientists are replaced, negated, or bypassed. Okay? Okay. Uh, now, certainly, uh, this can apply to private scientists if scientists cheat and don't get caught so that they, they, they bypass the procedures that scientists all accept for the kind of research they're doing. That, that can work there. But where we find this really uh, much more seriously uh, at, at stake is, of course, when government in, gets into the act. Okay? Now, I'll just remind, uh, probably some of you remember uh, the Lysenko episode in Soviet Russia uh, during the 1930s. Okay? This is a classic illustration of how government can actually destroy, uh, distort and destroy science. Uh, Lysenko was this political hack. He was a political hack who uh, had, was trained in uh, agrarian techniques, okay? uneducated. And he got the ear of some party apparatchnik uh, and was laying out this idea about how uh, you can graft, uh, the, the essential idea was you can, you can graft plants on and they will acquire the, the characteristics of the, of the uh, other, the thing that you're grafting onto. Well, that, 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 that's not good genetics and it's certainly not consistent with Mendelian genetics. And up at, at that time, uh, Soviet biology, Soviet genetics, was world class. It was absolutely world class. They were educated in the West. They had their, you know, very good scholars and everything, internationally recognized. No problem. Lysenko gets into the act, and uh, they armed with the, the 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 strong arm tactics of the party. Okay, it forced his theories on Soviet agriculture. It wasn't just the way they reorganized production. But more importantly, in, in some ways, it was what they did to the scientific community. Now, if you didn't buy into Lysenkoism, okay, you were shipped off to a gulag or you were disposed of in other ways. Okay? Uh, p- publish or perish brought on, uh, had a new meaning here, uh, actually. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, that, that was a, a serious issue. But of course, it was all accepted during the 1930s. Interestingly, the the ability of Soviet agriculture to recover from this fake, fraudulent kind of science and the, the simultaneous disappearance of good science, at least in the genetics area, uh, of course doomed uh, much of the agricultural seven-five-year plans in Russia to ongoing 
uh, underproduction, starvation, and you know the story there. All right. Now, th interestingly, Soviet genetics disappeared off the face of the earth, and it, w it, it, it didn't reappear until much later after Khrushchev finally, rec or his, I forget, it may have been Brezhnev, finally acknowledged that they had made a, a little mistake with, <laughs> with Lysenkoism. And only then did, was, was Soviet biology rehabilitated to some extent. Okay. So this went on for many, many decades. It destroyed the science in, in, uh, in the Soviet Union. A, a, a more subtle uh, uh, story here would be the, 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 uh, the, the uh, surrounds the work of uh, this uh, biologist, physician, uh, who won a Nobel Prize in medicine, uh, Baltimore, who was at the time that I'm going to address was president of the Rockefeller Institute. Uh, Rockefeller University, sorry, in New York. And uh, uh, he was a world-class biologist uh, by far. Well, he, he and some colleagues published a paper in 1986 uh, in Cell magazine, and some uh, irate and uh, d abused graduate student, or postdoc student, who was in the lab working, uh, took offense at some things. And she uh, lodged a, a suit against Baltimore and the authors of the article uh, uh, that claiming that fraud and, and misconduct, scientific misconduct, had occurred. Well, uh, it, it turns out uh, that after several inquiries at MIT and Tufts University, they were, the, these, these charges were utterly dismissed. But, but two enterprising people uh, in, in, the, in the government that were working with uh, Representative Dingell uh, at the time uh, caught on to this story and they started pursuing it and they adopted it as their crusade to ferret out all cheating fraudulent scientists. Well, uh, they didn't come up with very much but Representative Dingell saw an opportunity here and he organized hearings uh, to bring Baltimore and his colleagues before Congress. And in the course of doing that, his aim was to rehabilitate his little subcommittee on oversight that uh, was, was languishing and more, essentially moribund, had been quite moribund for quite some time. So this was a high-profile person uh, that they hauled into Congress. Uh, they, the, the Baltimore was subject, and I have it here. I, I got a list. Let me just list this to you. Uh, uh, if I can find it, uh, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, Dingell subjected Baltimore to the full force of adversarial government assets. The National Institutes of Health Fraud Unit, the Office of Scientific Integrity from the Health and Human Services Department, U.S. Treasury Document Examiners, U.S. US Secret Service Forensic Specialists, and Subcommittee Investigators and Lawyers. Baltimore's work, which was, uh, had been cleared of any wrongdoing by scientists in, as I mentioned, at the, at the university level, came under this vicious attack, and Dingle uh, used these hearings as a way of publicly humiliating Baltimore and claiming that just because Baltimore may have made some errors in some calculations in the paper, which he admitted to at the get-go from years earlier, that errors was a was a was a, a sufficient reason to assume misconduct. So anybody, anybody, any scientist who makes an error, according to Dingle, uh, is is guilty of fraud. So you just imagine what what that would do to science in 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 uh, if it were actually implemented on a widespread basis. The point here is that Baltimore's reputation was savaged by the these congressional hearings, and from and it was a reputational hit that he could not reclaim. He was fired. He was asked to leave Rockefeller University for the notoriety he had brought. Uh, he ended up finally, I think, at. Uh, Caltech as a, a professor, maybe a dean, I forget now. But his reputation was, was sullied beyond redemption, even though in the aftermath of the Dingle hearings and several years later, all of the accusations were reinvestigated again by other university boards, and they were all f found, you know, just scientific error had been made, but there was no evidence of misconduct. This is the way that government, through its regulatory Oversight function when it funds government, when it funds science, can actually affect what counts for science. 
Okay, that's the point of my remarks here. That when you have, when you combine the funding operation with a regulatory, and in this case, you might say congressionally approved or constitutional uh, legitimated function in the regulation area, you have a very powerful way of influencing what scientists can do and how you want to treat them. There are other examples of this. I've just picked out the one that you may have heard about, uh, but there are many, many similar examples of such things going on. Okay? Well, uh, in light of these things, it, 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 it should, I hope it suggests to you that the, 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 the kinds of frameworks within, science, within which scientists operate are going to be measurably affected by the, those arrangements. And if you have a laissez-faire approach to science, uh, absent the kind of regulatory oversight, for example, that Dingle was brought, uh, able to bring to bear in Baltimore, then science will be conducted in a different way uh, and on different criteria and different self-generating, self-enforcing uh, mechanisms. When you, add, when you add funding with a regulatory function, you get a different animal altogether. And uh, I, I mention this because this is where we're moving, folks. Uh, uh, Obama was very, has been very clear about this. He's setting up a new, a new research center, for example, that will uh, uh, be uh, with sufficient funds. Uh, who said there was a deficit anyway? Uh, <laughs> but with a lot of money that w is going to concentrate uh, uh, the, the, the approval process for bringing drugs to market. Uh, of course, it doesn't occur to them that the problem there is the FDA, not, not the scientific community. But that being said, uh, Obama makes, has made it very clear that uh, he is going to be very active in getting the right science put forth to satisfy his agenda. And, and how that's going to go on is, uh, uh, I think, a story that we won't really fully know for quite a while. Uh, but I imagine it's going to be a nasty story. Okay. So let me now turn to, uh, I think, a, perhaps a, a more contentious item, uh, monetary orders. I think monetary orders can also be modeled, obviously, as social orders, in which the transactions here pertain to banks, the customers, and the constraints imposed on them. Here, the transactions involve the issuing of loans and the redemption of notes, and the knowledge generated is visible at the level of reserves at individual banks and at, and at market premium and the market premium required for those transactions to go through. Okay, by drawing contrast between different monetary orders, we can carry out a form of comparative institutional analysis. I hope to highlight their respective knowledge using and, gen and adaptive qualities. So I'm going to talk about uh, two different monetary orders: a central banking one and a free banking one. Okay. Uh, uh, free banking along the lines of Selgin, White, and Horowitz, if you don't mind. But let me just continue here. Now, turning first to central banking, obviously the appropriate framework here is an interventionist system dominated by an institution that conducts centralized monetary planning and which is effectively exempt from the consequences of its own actions. Okay. Since its inception in 1913, the Federal Reserve has been complicit in causing all kinds of economic problems, uh, uh, that's amply documented. I'm sure all of you are aware of that. Uh, and the recent financial crisis, of course, highlights the failure of central banking and uh, as well as the failure of the attendant government policies that uh, were, were deployed there. Uh, it has also ushered in, however, something called not, uh, quantitative easing. And quantitative easing is a non-traditional way of affecting reserves to the banking system, especially in an environment where the interest rate which the Fed controls, the Fed funds rate, is, is very close to zero. So these are new tools that have been de deployed by the Fed. And uh, in, in, in connection with not only that, uh, the QE1, uh, with, when they bought all those mortgage-backed securities, and now QE2, when they're buying uh, 600 billion of uh, treasuries uh, uh, for, for over the next uh, several months, starting at past November, uh, they, they have gone, entered into a new realm here. Uh, not only has the, the Bernanke uh, seen to it that the uh, balance sheet of the Fed is more increased by 2.8 percent uh, times, 2.8 
times since uh, what, 2008, roughly. Uh, but also, the, the Fed has now become uh, a fiscal policy maker in many respects as well. So the blending of monetary and fiscal policy has uh, been achieved uh, by uh, by Bernanke and little Timmy Geithner. So the 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 uh, we're, in, we're in a new era uh, essentially. Uh, now. I want to mention that as developed by monetary equilibrium theorists, it's important to differentiate between benign deflation, which is what Bernanke's gender is pretty much about, and harmful deflation. The basic argument is that falling prices are benign, pardon me, benign when output is increasing, but harmful if the deflation is caused by an excess demand for money. And here I wish to suggest that monetary equilibrium argument that calls for an increase in the money stock in response to a perceived excess demand for money has questionable relevance for central banking. That is to say, my argument is that, and I'm not presuming anybody here is a free banker, I happen to buy into that probably more than some of you, but uh, the, the problem is, and here's the, the, I think I'm just going to lay it out and say it, that I think the problem here is that uh, the monetary equilibrium theorists, who also usually are free bankers, have argued uh, to some extent, some more than others, that uh, the, the, the Fed's activities during the early phase of the financial crisis reflected a response, could, should have been designed to reflect the existing excess demand for money. That is to say, to ward off deflation and, and its costs, uh, I know Steve Horowitz has uh, publicly mentioned that uh, the Fed should have increased the money supply back then, uh, not necessarily in the way they did through mortgage-backed security purchases, but the money supply should have been increased to solve that particular problem. I will, I will argue that that attempt to uh, generate uh, increase in the money supply uh, can work quite well under a free banking system, but when you apply that insight and to a central bank regime, you're really changing the game altogether. And it, that result that you take from your free banking model and try to apply it to your central banking model is flawed. Okay, So it's a misapplication of a approach that works in one institutional setting, free banking, and is meant and is used to apply or give policy advice to a central bank in a different, altogether, obviously, institutional setting. So that's, that's, that's the problem. Now, in a, in a free banking system, if there's an excess demand for money, uh, you know, banks will respond and they will re, uh, re, re, uh, issue more notes because people obviously want to hold more notes or hold the, per- t- the, t- the period of time during which they're holding notes. And hence, banks can uh, increase their, their, their liabilities by uh, increasing those notes. Uh, now, uh, there's, there's nothing particularly uh, dangerous about that. There are, I can't go into it here, obviously. I haven't got much time left, indeed. But the, the, the argument is that banks can respond in some sort of way to these sorts of problems, okay? And the, it, no one has to oversee it. It, it happens quite you know, automatically, in quotes. And it, it, it makes sense within the context of the free banking model. Now, I know, I'm not saying here, and I know, uh, you know, people, not everybody in this room is a free banker. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, my argument is not to defend free banking here. My, uh, I'm, I'm, that's not the, my point today at all. Uh, rather, I'm simply trying to argue that when you take a proposition that does make sense within that context and apply it to a contemporary policy setting, that's where the mistake is being made. That's that's a big mistake in my my judgment. Okay, now uh, I, I want to just uh, try to demonstrate that and use some like really cheesy graphs here uh, to to show that if you were to try to apply uh, some of these principles that we can glean from free banking models to uh, the, the Fed's actual situation, that uh, you don't end up with a, uh, a clear-cut uh, uh, policy instrument that will solve your problem at all. Okay, and let me just, you know, I'll, I'm not going to spend much time on this, but uh, see this one. So here's, here's Chairman Bernanke. Uh, and I, and I, 
Uh, but I, uh, and and now I've adulterated that photograph. I re <laughs> you know, it, it came out of the New Yorker, and it was black and white. I said, oh, this is exactly what I'm looking for, because uh, I can make it darker and more, more sinister, like Darth Bernanke. Uh, <laughs> uh, I shouldn't have said that, I guess. But, uh, but anyway, uh, uh, you know, this is just a, a, a took out of the St. Louis Fed, and you can see here... Um, uh, in, in, in the, res the recession and financial crisis in 07, 08, how uh, uh, M2 velocity fell quite substantially, and MZM velocity, which is a somewhat broader measure of the money stock, uh, also fell. Okay, so you can see that the, the pattern. Now the problem here is if you're, and this is the argument that the free bankers have made, that if you look at this particular point in time here, right around here, where things are starting to get pretty nasty, uh, can, you, can you legitimately say, gee, we can anticipate velocity falling, falling through the floor and taking action at that po point in time in order to forestall that maybe? I don't think you can, but let's say that's what you argue. And uh, so the question is, no, you haven't got that in. You have no basis for, for making that judgment in that particular point in time. You don't know what's going to happen to velocity. Okay. And indeed, if you look at it, it even, even through the beginning of all way, uh, you know, there's the, 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 the variance in, 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 in M2 velocity is not out of step with what it had been doing previously to that. So there's not, very, not a good case here that if you were on the Board of Governors of the Fed, you could say, ah, I, I know for a fact velocity is going to go through the floor and we better do something now about it. Okay. I don't think you can draw that conclusion. Why can't you draw that conclusion? Because the Fed is a centralized bank. They're getting all their information from all over. They, they have to deliberate. They have to do this. They, have to, they can't act spontaneously in the same sense that, a, that a, a free bank or a laissez-faire banking system can adjust on the spot to something like this where a, a bank is maybe experiencing an increase in its demand for its currency. Okay. It's be precisely because these laissez-faire bank, bank, banking systems are decentralized that allows them to respond in a timely and fast and appropriate way. Now, whether you, 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 you context that in the case of a free banking model or uh, uh, any other kind of laissez-faire system for banking, that's, that's pretty much what we're talking about, at least I'm talking about here, and, and that is something that's, that's not available to a central bank. Okay. Uh, also, uh, I, I put together here again the, uh, uh, the, the pattern of M2 velocity. I've collapsed the time period, as you can see, a little bit, and, uh, and measured uh, the, just measured out the monetary base, the, the red dotted line. And you can see here that even though the uh, the monetary base starts taking an enormous uptick uh, really in the middle of 2008. Okay, this is when the, the Fed started buying mortgage-backed securities, uh, doubling its, mon its, uh, its balance sheet very, very quickly. Uh, and you can see that, that despite that, despite that uh, response, okay, the Fed was impotent to stop the fall in velocity. Now, why was velocity falling? I mean, there's a lot of reasons there. A lot of them pertain to the policies themselves that were being pursued by the Fed, I think, and also a lot of it was due probably to the other policies that the government was punching out at this point. You know, TARP, TAF, uh, the, the uh, uh, housing subsidization and all of that sort of stuff. And that all played a role here in, in uh, neutralizing any effect the increase in the monetary base might have had. Okay, and you can see here that it had no effect, essentially, on, on velocity. So the Fed, even if it had been uh, omnipotent, I better get back, even if it had been omnipotent, okay, could, could probably never have adjusted in a fashion that would have approximated any other kind of laissez-faire banking system in terms of the, the quickness, the timeliness, and the appropriateness of the responses that a, a decentralized system can, can buy for you that you cannot get with a centralized banking system. Okay. Uh, so, in that sense, the problem with central banking is that it is a hopelessly ill-adapted institution for a modern monetary system. It just can't work. It cannot work. 
It can, it's, it's not that they can even be right by accident. You know? It, they, they can never be right. And, they, and the reason they can never be right because there is no way that a centralized banking system can mimic how a different institutional arrangement is going to function. In, our, in, this, in this particular example, uh, a free banking system. Okay. So, my concluding point uh, is, uh, and these are, some of the, you know, I'll, I, these are some of the things that I, I talk about in the paper, how the systems respond. I've, I've just summarized those very quickly. Okay. Here's Bernanke again, but he's part of the problem. right? He's part of the problem. If we put somebody else in there, it would not solve the problem, though, would it? Okay. That's the real problem. <laughs> and that's the, if you, it's the Federal Reserve uh, building in D.C. Okay. And I, I've altered that picture, too. A, 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 a look, I, I, looked, I looked everywhere for uh, sinister-looking uh, Federal Reserve building pictures. And uh, this one is, is, uh, was, a, was taken probably during a storm, and I just kind of you know, manipulated a little bit. But it suits my purposes, and I thought you'd get a kick out of that one. Well, anyway, I'll stop there. And uh, thank you very much. I'll take some questions. Uh, the gentleman in the white shirt there. Well, you said that government funding of science doesn't necessarily diminish the quality of the scientific research performed. Can we still make the case that it certainly slows it down and it's not efficient as a, you know, if a company or if the government's funding research for a cure, so research indefinitely take long lunch breaks, but a private company trying to bring it to market to profit off of cure is going to bring it out a lot faster, a lot more efficiently. Yeah, I, I, I think there's two, two ways of, of maybe answering that. If, if you look at the kind of science that's funded uh, within agencies of the government, I think you're going to find exactly what you've indicated uh, in, in, the, in the actual uh, doing the science. Uh, but, it, but a lot of the government funding of science is, is, is doled out to universities, and it's doled out by, a, uh, by, a, by things like... Uh, uh, you know the various uh, uh, agencies that are designed to allocate the funds to uh, institutions outside of the government. So, in, in in those cases, the scientists are just your everyday scientists working in their labs at a university, and they're constrained by the funding they have and their their, their research assistants and so forth. So, there's you might want to make an argument. Uh, that that sometimes what get what gets funded by government uh, wouldn't have been funded at all by uh, by, by private donors or philanthropists or uh, uni in house university funds. Uh, and, we, and we all know those absolutely laughable uh, stories about you know the uh, funding. Uh, uh, hog farms uh, for seeing how much CO2 they produce, right? Stuff like that you, you get with government funding too uh, because it's a political process and it's, it's, not, it's not meant necessarily to answer the, 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 the kinds of questions that scientists would, if they had their druthers, be particularly interested in probably. Uh, so you get some of that, but on the other hand, uh, the, 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 the parity I've described between government and, and privately undertaken science is, of course, contingent on uh, how, the, the monitoring of those funds and ensuring that, that in, in fact, scientists deliver on what their proposals say they're going to deliver on. And, of course, one of the dirty little secrets of this whole f funding process, and it operates to a, a perfection uh, in, a, a, with government funding, is that uh, scientists, it's well known, but it's hard to find this data. Uh, so it's well known among the scientific community that when scientists put in a proposal, they're putting in a proposal to uh, a funding agency of the government of research they've already completed. And the funding is then used for the next proposal, for the next research project. So there's, there's a lot of deception and gaming going on in the system. Uh, so there's, there's that too. Yeah. Uh, I, I saw the gentleman in the blue suit there. I just had a this is my view, I wanted to uh, hear yours. I think that uh, until, until the, the, I think the whole, the whole issue of uh, government funding is based on a fallacy that is that there is a distinction between basic and applied research. And I think the right. best way to kill that is to say, if you really wanted to make a case against government funding, not just the research, of public education, 
would be to kill that fallacy, to show that there is no distinction between basic and applied research. Because if you cannot show that, there will always be a ground to make the case for government. Couldn't agree with you more. Yeah, the, the, the question said there's really the connections between basic research and applied research are mutually in, in, integrated. Uh, is that a fair? Yes, yes. Yeah, yes, okay. If, if, if somebody proves that there is a distinction between basic and applied research, they will always have a ground to justify uh, tax and to fund. The basic research. Yeah, you know, the, the, um, the, 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 we, we are taught. Uh, and, in, uh, and, and, the, and the literature and the economics of science has for ye- decades now dr- been driven by this, this idea that uh, what, what was once called the linear model in, in, what, in science. And the linear model is basic research leads to uh, applied research leads to research and development. Okay? And that, that is from uh, uh, the work of Vannevar Bush, uh, who produced this book called The Endless Frontier back in 1946, and which led to this enormous expansion in government funding of science. That was his model. It's all wrong. And it was, it was wrong from, it was wrong then, and it's wrong now. What you find, and is, it, and it's a lot of literature that's come out recently that demonstrates this, that, that, that a lot of the theoretical insights that we gain uh, in science actually come out of the, the, the attempt to apply other research. So it's, it's, there's, there's all this mutual causation going on where you could argue, as you have, and I agree with you, that it's, it's research and development which generates a lot of the basic science. And it can, it can go both ways, and it does. There's no doubt about that. Um, yes, Guido. Your talk, you addressed the relationship between uh, spontaneous orders on the one hand and the distinction between benign and bad and deflation on the other hand. Uh, so it's like I couldn't get much... I mean, now a practical question. If you could uh, press, push the button in uh, September 2008, would you have abolished the federal drug system? Yes. <laughs> oh, the, the question was if I were king or something, right? I mean, uh, and, and we're talking in the events of, of 2008, would I have pressed the button to abolish the Fed? Yeah. Yeah, and then would you have put benign or would you? Uh, well, in this case, you're talking about a legislated decrease in the money supply, I, I think, right? Where, like, in Brazil, where they did that? What do you think? Well, I, I don't, th- I think when you, when you're in a recession, you don't have to contract the money supply, which is, which is, which might, that might happen, I don't know. Uh, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend that. What you do is stop and stop the, the inflation, stop the... Well, I would qualify remarks. If we could just get rid of the Fed and keep the money supply where it had been, we, I think we would have been fine. Jackson did away with the second national bank. When we went to the state bank, we did away with the Fed. We would have stabilized it. Do you think that that boom-bust problem would be equal with the bank? No. No. And that's, and that's a better solution than the no, I, 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 theory right yeah. now. Yeah. I, I, I mean, you look at, you look at, the, at, at business cycles and, and the, the credit cycles, uh, there's always the hand of, of interventionist that, that are, is at play in these things. Uh, I, th- I think the larger question, and, and I think probably a better answer to Guido's question would have been, what we need is, is a system to, to where we can have sound money. You know, you know, and and until we get there, I, I don't see any particular resolution of a lot of these problems. I think we're going to go through these cycles again and again and again. Yeah, I mean, yeah, something like that. So, uh, you know, but but I think I, I do. I would argue that as you move toward more centralized banking, these problems get worse. That's what I would argue. La- last question, I'm told. Uh, who wants to be the highest bidder? <laughs> okay. Uh, way back there. I think you did an excellent job outlining some of the misincentives from government funding for science, yeah. but to be a little provocative and push this in sure. the direction, there are some misincentives that come from the market structure, too, when we're speaking strictly about um, uh, science and trying to have emergent knowledge. I, uh, I missed that last remark. Trying to have emergent knowledge. If the goal of science is emergent knowledge, not necessarily practical, priceable 
knowledge. Yeah. Um, one thing I'm thinking of when you point out that hog farms are sort of a obvious waste of money, there are counterexamples like Alexander Fleming uh, penicillin or prion yeah. research in the 1970s, which certainly had long term practicable effects, came out of government funding. The, the other question I have is you didn't address, and I was hoping you might be able to address, uh, intellectual property capture by private corporations where, for example, patentable. Uh, information lasts for 19, now 30 years renewable. So uh, Pfizer, for example, gets derivative research from the University of Texas on Viagra and then uh, captures that market information for about 30 years. Yeah. Um, let me just say, the, the latter question will, is a big question, right? Uh, let, me, let me just try to... Uh, acknowledge your first question and say I, no, there's, no, there's no guarantee that any science that uh, whether it's funded by the government or by the private is, is going to have uh, some level of acceptability it, it, it's the very nature of the game that a lot of science is discarded uh, so that the, you, could, you could always call that an error or a mistake or something but the, but the point is that when you have lots of different funding going on Okay, lots of different sources of funding. You, you, you have a greater likelihood of generating more useful knowledge and, and also, because it is privately funded, you have a, a, a greater emphasis being placed on research that would generate better computers, better things that, that people want, as opposed to smart bombs, uh, you know, nerve gas, and, or w whatever. So uh, it, it's, it's a complicated kind of question. Uh, maybe we can talk about it later. Thank you very much, all. Appreciate it.